So ladies and gentlemen, we're here at the Detroit Bass Fest 2013 with none other than the legendary himself, one of the baddest and greatest bass players. I'm honored to be here interviewing him, Mr. Chuck Graney. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing great, homeboy. I'm doing great. A Cleveland bass player in the house. Now actually, I'm gonna make it clear. I was born in Cleveland. Large family in Cleveland, but at six we moved to Youngstown. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was raised, and, and uh, basically music and family, my father's family is from Youngstown. So I'm born in Cleveland, but I hold it to Youngstown because that's where I, it all started. When did you start playing the bass, and why? I was 21 when I started playing the bass, and I started playing the bass because I was playing, uh, playing guitar in a band. They had three guitar players and a drummer. And I was playing single note patterns, and the leader's wife was playing rhythm guitar in background. Me and her are saying background vocals, and he sang lead, and um, and also played lead. And we had a drummer. So one day the drummer said, "Man, why don't you get a bass?" So I asked my mother, and she got me a bass. That's how I started playing that bass. How many years you say you've been playing? How you say? Uh, this is my 51st anniversary. Although I call it my 50th anniversary. So this year is my 50th anniversary, although it's really 51. Uh, who was some of the influences for Chuck Rain as a bassist? Well, to be honest with you, they were all upright players. Sam Stewart, Mel Hinton, George Vivier, Richard Davis. Uh, those were all my beginning hero, and Jimmy Smith. Uh, those were all my um, first heroes, the people that I would listen to, listening to jazz. You know, of course, um, the upright is not that audible, <clears throat> but my first recollection of being interested in the bass really was Jimmy Smith, here in that, or because that Youngstown was an organ town at the time, and an upright town. So they basically were the people that um, got me interested in um, wanting to play the bass, the sound of the bass, upright players. When did you start getting those gigs, man? How did it, how did it, uh, how did you become who we know as Chuck Rain, the basis? Well, once I got to New York, I hung out in Harlem for a couple of years, I would think, playing in different bands, playing nightclubs, and then finally, and then I finally started working with King Curtis. And King Curtis came out of the studio around. He did all the, he was the yakety sax for the coasters and a whole lot of other uh, things like that. And um, just about everybody that was ever in King Curtis's band ended up being a studio musician at one time. As a matter of fact, that's how I got in his band. His bass player, Jimmy Lewis, started getting studio work and did not want to travel outside the city. And so that's when he came and got me. And of course, after I got, I think I was with Curtis for from 60, maybe 63 to 67. And it was time to move on, and he changed bands, really. And then, but I started doing studio work while I was still in his band, because I was in his band. And then once it got to be a point to where I couldn't leave town, or didn't want to leave town, then I had to leave the band and start working in, in New York in the studios. So that's how it started, basically being in his band. If you were in his band, they knew you could read. They knew that you knew all the top 40 songs, you know, you knew all the styles. And uh, some of them credit my, by, by, me, by me being in his band. It's why people start calling me to do demos and stuff like that. I just found out that that was you, that was you playing the bass on the Sanford and Son theme song. Mm -hmm. um, how, what, what, what other TV theme songs and, and work like uh, sound, soundtracks have you done? It's been a whole lot, bro. Yeah, a whole lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's kind of hard for me to, to recollect it, but what it is on allmusic.com, they list everything that I've ever done. Also, to on my website. On my website, they gathered all that information, and from the union, they gathered all the information that's on my website. 
But I did Macmillan and Wife. I did uh, the Fat Albert series. You know, I did the Archies, uh, uh, Beretta, a lot of those things. Uh, that is awesome. Um, uh, what's uh, not Sanford Son, but also to uh, uh, was that Moving On Up to the East of Jeffersons, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know, all that stuff, man. Basically, was done by the same person, like Quincy. Quincy Jones, and I'm having an old age moment here, but there were two other people like Quincy that did all the soundtracks in Hollywood, and they did it all, so once you work with one person, you're doing a whole lot of that stuff. Uh, Jack Elliott and Alan Ferguson, Quincy Jones, there's probably a couple more that I can't think of right now, but they, do, they did all those TV things, and did all those things, the same people. It's very, very hard for new people to get in, because once you're in, you're in, you know, and they don't hire anybody else. They stay with the same group of people. So I was very lucky. I went to, I went to Hollywood with, with Quincy. And, you know, if you come in town with Quincy Jones, everybody's going to want to give you a shot. You know, so I've been very lucky that way. Very lucky. Right, and, and one of my favorite bands to do with, and I, again, I didn't know that at the time, um, was Steely Dan. That, that is some... Awesome, awesome bass work, man. <clears throat> one of your favorite bands uh, you played with? Can you just name some of the Oh, bands? absolutely. Steely Dan, um, Harry Belafonte. With Aretha, we had the band of the world. The band uh, that those beginning, beginning years of Aretha after she left Detroit. Me, Cornell Dupree, Bernard Purdy, Richard T. What a band. What a band. We never had a bad night or a bad song. Um, is that the question <laughs> you yeah, asked me? Just some of your favorite bands that you uh, It's kind of hard because, you know, I really enjoy playing. I'm in love with music and, and the bass. And it's hard to pick out a particular thing, but I do remember King Curtis, Top of the Mountain. Great band. Great band. We did the 65 Beatle Tour, which was great. Uh, and then Harry Belafonte. Roberta Fleck also had a very good band that I enjoyed playing with. What you been doing here in Detroit since you been here, man? Eating. <laughs> what's, what's that you got in your hand? Uh, no, I mean, not the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the, the bass. <laughs> uh, what's that you got? Uh, this is, a, is an exotic bass. It's a custom bass. They made it for me. I've been with them for about four years, maybe five years. Now, very, very good people. Very, very good people. And you gonna be? Are you gonna be playing that tonight? Yes. Okay. Matter of fact, it's brand new. And, and uh, like I said, I didn't want to keep you, man. Um, but it's a, uh, like I said, it's a pleasure and an honor to actually get to interview you and put you on my resume, and man. Uh, Thank you very much. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing before you go play for us? Well, one thing, I'm very happy to be alive because at one time it was very dark for me. I had a serious stroke two years ago, and I'm still recuperating from it. But at least I'm not paralyzed and I can't talk, and I can play. You know, I'm not back 100%, but I'm back enough to be able to play and talk. So I'm very happy for that. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for the career that I've been handed by the universe. It's been very, very good to me. And of course, my hometown is very important to me. That's where I learned everything that I know how to do. My musicianship, what to do, what not to do, I learned by coming from uh, Eastern Ohio, out of Cleveland and Youngstown. You know, and I, anybody from that area, I want you to know that, that we've got a lot of talent out of that area. And I'm very proud to be from Cleveland and Youngstown. And when everybody knows that I love music, I'm in love with music and I love the bass. I want to thank you, too, brother, for. Uh, I hope that I, I hope I, I forgot this was down, but I want to thank you for to, wanting to take time with me. You know, I'm always elated. Anybody from home that wants to talk to me or say hello, so it's always great to see you. Always great. And I thank you very kindly for having me on the show. All right, all right. and ladies and gentlemen, now let's check them out, Mr. Chuck Ray performing at the Detroit Bass Fest 2013.
There's none higher than this gentleman right here, Mr. Chuck Green. Thursday night when we saw him. Oh, yeah, uh, you got the picture? We can show the picture. Oh, no, 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 uh, young people, as long as folks of all ages. Absolutely. And when I originally called Mr. Rainey, we just wanted him to come hang out with us and just be in the spirit with us. But he wanted to play. Yeah. Yes. He wanted to be here, and he's here. And we have bestowing upon him. Actually, this award really is called the Ralph Armstrong Guardian Award because Ralphie was actually the first one that we gave it to. So, the Guardian Award is hereby given to Chuck Rainey, given to bassists who have given their time, talent, philanthropic endeavors, and career achievement to the education advancement of the bass violin and electric bass given on this Lord's Day on Saturday, November 2nd, 2013. From every guy who ever picked up a bass, Mr. Rainey, thank yes. you. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so very, very much. I have really enjoyed 51 years of playing that bass. And I love to play the bass. You know, I'm in love with it. My wife understands that. My kids understand that. Kid, you understand it. Um, and I've had a wonderful career. Of course, it, most human people have only seen the tip of the iceberg. There's been a lot of stuff under the water that you don't know about, but you can just imagine what it's like. It ain't been easy. But then again, that one tip has made me very, very proud. And I'm very proud to be here. When, uh, when Lester called me, I felt very, very good about it. Now, when it comes to doing something like this, Especially being around these guys. I just met Larry. What a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. What a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Buckeye. Yeah. Now we're all from Cleveland. Jordan, Doug, and a few people here, Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm very glad to see Buckeyes, that's for sure. But I want to thank you all very, very much. When he asked me to come, I didn't hesitate. I wanted to come. He said I didn't have to play. Yep. And I said, well, I'm going to have to play. Yeah. If you don't know, two years ago, I had a very serious stroke yep. that paralyzed the left side of my body, and I couldn't talk for about a month. And I told the neurologist, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. I'm going to come back. <laughs> and I want to play. I need to play. Amen. I ain't 100%, but I'm 80%. Yep. And I'm going to do the best that I possibly can. And I like to talk about my career because there are a lot of things that a lot of people do not understand, musicianship being one of them and also be in love with the music that you're playing. Yes. And also to understand that your ego, you have to control that ego. Yes. You know, because people have to like you to work with you. Yes. You also have to know your instrument, which means you have to spend a lot of time with it. I'm taking part of what my segment is, but maybe we, I want to do a lot of talking. You're going to find I'm going to be very long-winded. <laughs> However, this is the way that I am. But it's very, very important to keep our youth to understand how important it is to love something. Yes. And once you love it, the universe is going to pay you back and take care of you. And it's taking care of me my whole career. Yes. Yes. 51 years of playing that bass, and the universe is taking care of me because I'm in love with it. Yes. I love it. Lester, Glenn, thank you so very, very much. This is very, very special. We're too honored. We're too honored to give it to you, Chuck. Man, well, thank you so very, very problem, much. Bro. Very, very much. Feel free to ask me anything because it is important. I have had 
my experiences in the industry, and a lot of it has to do with uh, musicianship. Also, to knowing the instrument and watching that dog on ego. We all got to have it to do what we got to do, but you have to control it. You, you got to be in charge, not that ego. People have to like you. They keep hiring you. They have to like you. Amen. One of my pleasures to come here and meeting Lynn and meeting um, Brother Bay. Where is he at? Brother Bay? Brother Swanson? He's around there somewhere. A pleasure. Friday night, went over the birds. And I've always been a lover of upright players. Come here, Paul. Oh, <laughs> yes, sir, Uncle Chuck. <laughs> and I've watched all my career, although I play the electric bass, I've, my, my role models have been upright players. And I met Ralph Friday night and I watched him play for a set. And I'm telling you, brother, you can play that bass. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. 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 I'm very proud of me. I've heard, a lot. I've heard his name a lot, and I've never met him. Now I finally got a chance to hug him and meet him and let him know, you know, that I really love the way he plays that upright bass. I wish I could do it, but I can't do it. But I do what I can do on that electric bass. You know. I got I got to say something about uh, one of the masters of the bass. Period. When I was a kid, I bugged my mother and father to give me every dog on record Chuck Rainey played over Quincy Jones. I said, my mama played like him. I listen to that. This guy invented double stops on the electric bass. Nobody did it with the flat five double stop. <laughs> and I did it about 4,582 times trying to be like this man. It's such an honor that he thinks so highly of me because if it wasn't for Chuck Rainey, I might be out there stealing all your cars and hubcaps and every damn thing. Because this is a master and he's right about ego. And people don't understand this to be, to achieve greatness is to acquire as much knowledge as possible and to become an intellectual with your instruments. And don't be close-minded, you know, because we're sitting up there listening to everybody. My man played the bass like a, a, a what, Paganini over here. <laughs> like a violin, and we're digging it. We're like, you know, digging it, you know, because it's something different. You know, you got to be open-minded and learn as much as you can about this instrument. Me and Chuck are very similar because we are very long-winded. We are two intellectual bass players. <laughs> he is long-winded. But I'm older. <laughs> Another thing, too, about coming to Detroit, I've been to Detroit that I can remember three times. Once with uh, uh, Aretha, of course. And then uh, with, um, boy, I'm having an old age moment here. Uh, Aretha, anyway, Spiderweb. Y'all look at this brother right over here. Raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. Me and Spider, me and Spider have played on so many records in Hollywood and New York. It was, I haven't seen you in 35 years, 25 years. 25 years. We left New York at the same time with different people. In New York, we played with Harry Belafonte. Bless his heart. I mean, Harry Belafonte. Y'all check out Harry Belafonte. You talk about a gentleman, a scholar. He was wonderful to work with. We both learned a whole lot by being in his band for two years. Aretha Franklin, yeah. King Curtis, yeah. me and this man right here. A lot of playing. I love you, dude. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. And it's so great to see you. Yeah. And now, He's the band leader of the Next Generation Funk Brothers, by the way. And we are keeping what Earl Van Dyke did, we're keeping it going because they taught us. Now, I have always liked the uh, coming from playing a Fender. Fender only has two knobs a, a, a volume knob and a tone control, and I'm used to that. This is very, very close. It has a lot of knobs on it, but it's not really a, a lot of knobs. I just found out that this is passive and that's active. Well, I've been playing it active because it sounds that way. I'm going to have to apologize. I don't want to play because I'm freezing. I live in Texas where it don't get cold. And uh, I'm, I can't even make a fist. And, I, and it's not an excuse. Uh, I wasn't doing that well to begin with, but I couldn't play. 
you know, but I can't even make a fist. I'm freezing. So y'all, please, please understand that I would love to play, but I'm cold in my hand. I'm even, in no sense even trying it. Especially if I gotta follow Quentin and Larry. <laughs> you know, but I was prepared. All my stuff is here, but I'm only gonna make a fool of myself. I just can't do it now. So please forgive me. Next year, I'm gonna start to support the new CD next February. And being that I'm from the Great Lakes, I'm gonna start in Detroit and go east. And end up, oh, not end up in Cleveland, but I'm going across Great Lakes in Pittsburgh and end up in New York, where I finally made my career in New York. I will start in Detroit. Uh, and I will be back in February or March. Uh, Y'all come on out. Everybody gets in free. <laughs> but please, excuse me for not playing right now. It's getting kind of late anyway, but I cannot even make a fist. I'm freezing. You play. <laughs> You're a guitar player, don't play. Yeah, but it's a wonderful instrument. It's a wonderful, it's a P bass style. I've been playing the jazz style. And um, I like the sound of the bass, but this is very, very special. Very, very special. It feels great. It looks good too, I think. I've never played a light bass. I always played a, 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 a colored bass. But uh, this is a very, very nice bass, and I just appreciate it so much. The love and the concern that Toshio has given me uh, with that company. I don't have to take it to Japan. I have one in Japan. Nobody plays it but the, but the tech in Japan. And he's a personal friend. He knows. He sets it up. He knows how I play. He almost plays just like me in a way. We, we, we play alike. So I don't have to take it to Japan. I don't have to take a bass to L.A. And pretty soon I won't have to take one to New York. <laughs> <laughs> but this is my personal instrument. I really love it. I really love it. And I'm very, very, uh, I'm just uh, so appreciative of you guys being in my corner this way because I, I, you know, somebody said, well, Chuck, you deserve it. I said, well, maybe I deserve it, but still I'm so appreciative because a lot of people deserve it. There are a lot of appreciative. John, it's great to see you after so many years. Did you hear what I said? John? <laughs> it's great to see you after so many years. Um, so pardon me for not playing, but I can't. I'm freezing. His hand was just coming back anyway. But we can talk. Anybody want to talk to me? I'm here to you can talk to me. Yes, sir. Why do you prefer a rosewood fretboard over a maple fretboard? Because that's the horse I rode in on. <laughs> <clears throat> My first bass had a, had a uh, rosewood fingerboard on it, and I just used to that. Also, the color. Now these dots light up when it gets dark. These are they're, they're, they're very bright. But still I'm used to a darker fingerboard. And the rose uh, the uh, um, that rosewood has the tendency to be soft, but it's just something that my fingers are used to. So it's just a feel, it's just my habit. I rode in on that horse and you know, it's like seeing an old girlfriend or an old ex-wife that you still dig. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say about the bass. I do like it. Uh, I like it a whole lot. I never would have wanted a, a light bass, a white bass, but this is the bass is on the album. And I did play a five string. I play a five string more than I play a four because that's where it's at. You know, it is what it is, and I love that low B. However, when it comes down to really playing the bass, I'm a traditional four string player. I can grip that sucker like a baseball bat and play it, you know. And then with the drop E, go down to a D, I at least go down to a D, which I do do. Um, that's all I can say about the bass. Uh, I like it, that's one thing for sure. I do like it, it's 10 days old. You know, so in about another month, it'll forget it was a tree. <coughs> and it'll be a bass. Come on, kid, ask me a question. They didn't want you to use your thumb. Can you tell that story? Oh, about, about Peg? Yeah. You, you, everybody's heard that story, haven't you? No. no. <laughs> well, Jeff Beccaro, one of the greatest drummers that ever lived, by the way, he was Toto's drummer. And Jeff and I were uh, on a lot of calls together in Hollywood to play together. And Jeff, 
because we worked a lot together, we were good friends, and we worked, played together very, very well. And Jeff, every time he'd see me, he'd put this imaginary bass on his chest and say, Randy. Because every now and then I did slap the bass. But the slapping at that time, Lewis Johnson was the bass player that was doing all the slapping. And when I listened to Lewis, Billy Preston, and all of Billy Preston's hits, Lewis Johnson was playing on. Now, I'm old school. I like to hear the wood on the bass. So when I slap the bass, I want to sound like Bill Hinton or George Vivier, where you could hear that wood. But when Lewis was slapping, he had so much highs on the bass that it didn't sound like a bass to me. It sounded like a bass, but it didn't sound the way I thought a bass should sound if he was going to uh, slap it, because he had so much treble on it. So Donald, Donald Fagan, he had been listening to, to uh, Billy Preston, and he did not like slapping on the records. He didn't like it at all. As a matter of fact, on Nightfly, he still didn't like it. He didn't, on Nightfly, he didn't want me to slap the bass. Although the two Nightfly is a good slapping line. But of course, you know, you work for somebody, you do what they ask you to do. Anyway, on this session, their style was, they got four or five uh, musicians in the rhythm section, and they play the song, or they start playing. They're only listening for a drum track. It took three years to make Asia. And of course, three years of salaries really helps people like me. <laughs> but anyway, it took a long time to do it because this is the way they worked. They got the rhythm sections playing, they only listen to the drummer so that they can start working on that track or build that track. After the drummer stops playing, they say, okay, we can work with that. Then the bass is next. Now they're listening to me. Then of course, after they're satisfied that they can work with, then they go to the guitar or they go to the piano. That's the way they, they did it. So while they're playing, when we got to the bridge of Peg, being I know they're not listening to me, so I slapped the bass on it. You know, because I knew I was going to have to replace it. And so after about an hour goes by, and it took that long, of course, that's the way it is. He goes up, goes to his, eat, or calls somebody, or call whatever the case may be. Now they're listening to the bass, and we're playing to the drum track that he laid down. When it got to the bridge, we started redoing the bridge because Donald was saying that it doesn't, something, it doesn't sound the same, which means they were listening to it. And so Jeff said, well, he's slapping it. So what I did when, when, I, when I slapped the bass uh, uh, on, on the chorus while they were listening to him, the studio glass is here, and what I did was just turn around, <laughs> looking at Jeff, and I just, so they didn't see me do it. So it ended up being that what they did was he tried to work on it with fingers, and it didn't sound, it sounded okay, I thought, but it didn't sound the way that they liked it. That's why I say too, a lot of times, people that, uh, that you're working for, they may want things and they, be, they could be wrong. But because they're the producer or the artist, they can never be wrong. You know, and, and they, they, they think about it for a while. So we ended up using the very same track. I didn't even have to play it over again. Because again, like I said before, once you play something one time, if that's your honest opinion, and you have professionally performed it, you don't have to do it again because now you're just guessing yourself. You're just trying things that ain't gonna work. Uh, before I leave, I want to talk about James Jimerson for a second. But when Motown moved out to Hollywood, a lot of us bass players went to, we went to Motown, and I hated it. I hated it because the Motown producers they want to work all day on one song. They had it three takes on three takes, but now we're on our 18th uh, take. Hmm. The guy who was directing the band at the time was not the orchestrator, but they're breaking a sweat. Do this, the band. We got a click track in a year. Now I'm talking about Hollywood Motown. I'm not talking about Detroit Motown. You know, we got the band, we got a click track in a year, and we're all professional, but still we got the guy that wrote the song standing in front of the corner, and he's breaking a sweat. <laughs> One song all damn day. And that gets to be kind of boring, where we had it, the first hour and a half of the first time. Um, how did I get to Motown? <laughs> yeah, you just jumped. <laughs> I'm here so many. Okay, you made it right. You want to say about James? Uh, Jameson. Jameson. I was going to get to James Jameson, but um, <laughs> oh, we, we, we were talking about slapping, and then we left slapping. I'm really long-winded. Sometimes I forget what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about Peg. 
Yeah. And so it works out. Well, Night Fly, he did. I wouldn't do it at all. Now, on Night Fly, the only thing I played to was a drum machine at Rick Derringer. Guitar and a drum machine. And so I'm sitting there, so now they're looking at me. So he didn't want me to slap the bass. You know? Lewis Johnson is a great bass player. Believe me, he is, and he's a great slapper. He bleeds when he slaps. I went to a land show one time, and he was slapping in the booth, and blood just going everywhere. <laughs> he don't care, but he's a good rhythm player, a good player, except for the tone of the bass. And I think that's why Donald Fagan did not like slapping. But he had never heard me slap, because I'm old school. I want to sound like Bill or George. You know, like that big upright when I slap it. Which I hope Peg sounds that way. Of course, with a electric bass, you can put a little treble on it. But that's how that's that story, Joe. That's that story. Hey, Chuck. I heard something once. Someone said he was talking about taking. He said after the second tape, you're imitating yourself. And that's true. Yeah. Not only are you imitating yourself, especially if you're pro. You already know what you're doing. All you're doing is guessing. And we used to work for a spider. I used to work for a producer. I'm not, I almost named him, and that's not good to do. He would spend two weeks doing an arrangement. He was a saxophone player. When we got to the studio, he had very good musicians, and we would get it first, second, or third take, but he wanted to work on it because he had spent two weeks working on the arrangement. Paying the butt. However, when I complained this to my, to my mother, she would say, you got to be a fool. You are doing what you're doing, what you love to do, that comes easy, and you're complaining. And I stopped complaining because that teach that they gave strength in my fingers, gave strength in my hands, with my fingers, my hand, and uh, all that's good. You know, like I learned how not to take anything personal, which I don't, even if it is personal, I don't care. I'm the bass player, I got hired by whoever, and if you don't like me, that's your problem. I'm just gonna do the best I can, I don't take it pro uh, personal. No, I'm not, I'm not a little wimpy little guy, I don't, let people just talk to me any kind of way, but then there's a professional way to conduct yourself in all situations, you know? And there's a way to tell somebody to back off if they're not being uh, professional or the way that they should be. And while I'm talking about that, I'll get to James Jameson. While I'm talking about that, it's important to know that a lot of people are not English majors. Everybody does not know how to say what they need to say perfectly. We just say what we got to say. Sometimes it seems like it's rude. Sometimes it's not. All the person wants is for you to understand them. Walter Becker and Donald Fagan are very, very strange people. But you listen to their music. <laughs> you listen to their music, and the music is incredible. They're incredible. All they wanted was their music to be played and for people to understand them. So it's for a lot of sidemen that they hired, or that the producer hired, they didn't particularly care for them because they were very, they never smile. They just stuff people that don't smile. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they're bad people and stuff like that, but the music is incredible. I enjoyed every unnecessary record date that I did. <laughs> the scale again, because I got paid. And I got paid double scale, so did everybody. And also to hearing that music, if you want to not familiar with Steely Dan music, boy, y'all check out the Royal Scam, the Gaucho in Asia. It's beautiful music. So every time that I got a chance to go in the studio and do it, I'm smiling. I'm feeling great because I love to hear the sound. Also, too, one last thing about Steely Dan in Asia. I've had so many great compliments about the bass patterns on the Steely Dan stuff, especially Asia. People, let me tell you something. I played that album the, on that album, there's seven songs, seven drummers. That means that those seven drummers played the whole album. I happen to be the only bass player at that time on Asia. So by the time you listen to Asia, I had so many opportunities to play that bass line. I had so many opportunities. How can it not be good? You know, and each session took at least two weeks. And there were seven sessions. Uh, on that record, so I had a lot of time. You know, I thank everybody for thinking of me that way, but I really had a lot, of, you know, I walked in UB after, after so many weeks of playing the same thing and making sure in overdubs and doing the same thing again. It's crazy. I've sat and been paid to play the same thing over and over and over and over again, not knowing why, not really caring why. <laughs>
you know, because when I leave there, other people say, hey, Randy, how you doing? You work with us and working with uh, Gary Katz with the, with the Steely Dan. Oh, man, yeah. So I, I walk away and everybody says, Chuck Randy's or well, Warner Brothers. So it makes me feel good. I'm working with something that's successful. You know, so I didn't care. I go home, my wife is happy. The dog was happy. <laughs> and before the baby was born, he was even happy. Before he was born. Hey, Chuck. I just want to say one thing while you're on the thing about Asia, because it's one of the greatest albums I've ever listened to. And regardless of whether you played a hundred times through the same song, it's your feel on those songs. And nobody does it like you. Thank you. I certainly love doing it. I certainly love doing it. And I'm, thank you very much because the music is just incredible. Mm -hmm. James Jameson. Detroit, y'all have no idea what that man did for this instrument. You have no idea. Muscle Swanston played it with the Ink Spots back in the 50s. Uh, Mum Montgomery played it with Lionel Hampton. And then they played it in their genre. But James Jameson put this bass on the map in pop music. James Jameson. He had a style, he had a sound, and never let anybody else, if you're a bass player, let me tell you people, don't let anybody else tell you that they played those songs, the Four Tops, the Supreme, Stevie Wonder, and somebody else does claim to do it. I ain't mentioning no names, but y'all know who I'm talking about. Don't let anybody tell you that. If you got ears, you can hear James Jameson. Yes, that's right. Motown, the person who claimed to have done all those records, <laughs> out, in, out, out in LA, I played a lot of Motown stuff. I played Bernadette. I did. But I didn't play Bernadette for the Four Tops. I played Bernadette with uh, Tina Marie or somebody who was doing an old Motown hit. I played a lot of that Motown stuff. But I wasn't the originator. And Detroit, don't let nobody tell you that another bass player did that. James Jameson is the godfather of the electric bass. I listened, when I got to New York, I had to do all Motown stuff in order to make a living. And I had to listen to James Jameson. Also too, there's been a lot of negative things said about James. Yes, he was an introvert, yes, he was strange. But then he was James Jameson. I'll tell you how strange he was. When I first met him, I was working with Big Jamie Neely, and I was on tour with a, a band that he was working with, and they came through Cleveland. Keith 105, and there was about seven acts on the show. I had never met James. I had not, uh, met anybody really from Detroit. And the bass player before the band that, that I was in played, he busted his speaker and asked could he use my amp. And I said, sure. He busted my speaker. <laughs> so then we got to play it. I had to play with no amplifier. All the bass players' amplifiers are lined up the same way, and all the guitar amplifiers are lined up. And after we played on the little in intermission break, this guy walks up to me and he says, Hey man, how come you didn't just plug in my amp? It's just we had the same amp. A Fender Twin. He said, Why didn't you plug in? I said, Well, man, I don't play in anybody's amp unless I ask. You know, stuff like that. He said, Man, my name is J Mo. And he said, Whenever you see me, and we're on the same show, and, so, and you need an amplifier, you can plug into my amplifier. Now, to that's, I didn't even know him. Didn't even, I didn't even know him. Now, for a man to say that to a stranger, he wasn't strange at all. He was not strange at all. He was a wonderful bass player, and inside he was that wonderful man. And we all should remember James Jameson. You know, he made it possible for all of us to make this instrument something. Now, I'm gonna stop talking because I warned you, I was long-winded. <laughs> But I have to say something about James Jameson. Nice. Because of him. Now, we, I guess if he were alive, he would be about the same age, maybe a year older than me. So I, I wouldn't say that he caused me to play this instrument. I play this instrument because it's easier than playing it upright. You know, and plus I was a guitar player before I played the bass. You know, so we came up about the same time. But the Motown songs that he played on, now, Bob Babbitt was also a good bass player, but James Jameson mm -hmm. is the reason we all play this bass. 
now in pop music. Now I forget what the original question was, but I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> James. It's really great to talk about somebody that you love dearly, and I knew him. I met him in LA. He was a bit bitter, but he needed more credit than he got. He's gotten more credit for his work since he has passed than he did when he was here. Now we can blame half of that on him because he was to himself. You know, he was to himself. Thank you for the comment you made about Steely Dan. I do love to, uh, I think it is my field. And then also Walter thought it was me also because they tried every bass player in Hollywood. You know, they tried everybody. But they stuck with me on that one record. And I liked it too because I got paid. <laughs> I got paid. Yes, sir. Speaking of Steely Dan, did they ever ask you to tour with them when they started? No. Uh, you see, we were, a lot of the players are very resentful for that. A lot of the guys that did that work because they were never asked to tour with them. But everybody, they don't understand. They don't understand. There's always a reason why you don't have, why they didn't ask us to play. Number one, they're going to have to pay for it. Because if you're going to stay at home and make money, you know, stay at home and make money, why go on the road? Now, I've been on the road a lot, as you may imagine. And so in order to get me on the road, they've got to pay me. <laughs> they've got to pay Larry Carlton. They've got to pay Bernard Purdy. And they've got to pay, because if, if you don't, they lose the money. So they choose good musicians who can emulate the music. You know, right now, you know, uh, Ready Freddy is playing bass, and I'm telling you, he's doing it. Freddy Washington is doing it. You know, he's a good friend. It makes me feel like a real old man. I know I'm older, but I met Freddy when he was 15. A little bit of trivia, Patrice Russian was his bass teacher when he came out of Oakland. And I met him when he was 15, he's now 42, and I feel old. Uh, but they don't ask for that reason. You gotta pay big salaries, because a lot of these guys are making six figures in the studio. Now it may be a little bit different, but uh, back in the day, when you, once you get a band plus, when you got a guy that's already halfway financed and secure, you gotta deal with him. When he's on the road, he don't really need the gig. You gotta hire somebody that needs the gig, because they can walk, you can walk away anytime you get ruffled, or you feel somebody ain't treating you right, or you don't have the right endorsement. And you start hiring us, you know, we gotta bring our endorsements, we got half of us have managers, so they just choose good players. That's why none of us really play with them. I gotta say this too about uh, about Steely. Every time they come, they come to Dallas, I'm invited to come to the show. Every year, so I've seen them many, many times. This year, I'm so fortunate because they really brought the house down on me. You know, I came to the show, I visited before the show, and during the show, they sent somebody down to the audience to get me. This is a 10,000 room seat house. Come down and got me and brought me on stage and thanked me for being a part of their music. I never will forget it. Very few people have done that for me, you know. And then it, well, it wasn't required to do it, but it made me, and Walter and Donald don't do this. <laughs> they're very, they're very yeah. different kind of people, but they did it and it makes me feel so very proud of myself. So very proud of myself. While I'm talking about that, Donald Byrd and Roberta Flack are the other two people who have gone out of their way to say something in public to me, you know? And it makes me feel so good because as a side man, I never expect that stuff because I do a job. You know, but I had seen Roberta for maybe 15 years. I picked up the phone and it was her. And she talked to me for an hour, thanking me for being in her life. And I thought that was just so precious. Down at Bird at the Playboy Festival, where the band, the stage goes around, they put one band on this side while another band is playing, and when that band's through, the stage turns. And I was working with Herbie at the time, and we were on stage, and all the other bands were out there, and he hollered out, Chuck Reaney, thanks for the hits. And I almost melted. And I never met Donald Bird personally, because his records, like a Justin Five, they were never there. They were produced, and then they came in and added this stuff. But it made me feel so blessed. I try not to overuse that word, but it made me feel so good to have somebody uh, in, in public. Uh -oh. I think that's a sign. <laughs> Guys, Detroit, I want to thank you so much. Carolyn, it was great being on your show. Thank you so very, very much. I really enjoyed myself. 
Kids and Joe, it's great to see you guys. Great to see you. Ralphie, where's Ralph at? I love you. I love you. You're a great bass player. Detroit, thank you so very, very much. Lester. I'm out of here. I'm going to stay in touch. I'll just watch. I'm going to stay in touch. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to Detroit Bass Fest 2013. We look forward to seeing you in 2014. Have a safe evening and drive safely.